Buenas tardes, bienvenidos al coloquio del Instituto de Ciencias Nucleares de la UNAM. El día de hoy tenemos a Rory Barnes como invitado. Él es profesor asistente en el Departamento de Astronomía y del Programa de Astrobiología de la Universidad de Washington. Eh, nos va a presentar una plática acerca de las oportunidades y obstáculos para la vida en Próxima Centauri B, que es el exoplaneta más cercano a nosotros, no hay ningún otro exoplaneta más cercano. Eh, él es miembro del eh, Virtual Planetary Laboratory, que es un proyecto asociado al Instituto de, de Astrobiología de la NASA desde hace 15 años. Eh, bueno, el, el, el Virtual Planetary Laboratory es el proyecto asociado al Instituto de Astrobiología. Él no lleva 15 años. Sí, no, no. <risa> Solamente 17 años. Sí. Yeah, he has been there like half of the time. Entonces, eh, estudió la, el, eh, su licenciatura en física y astronomía en la Universidad de Arizona. Eh, luego estudió el doctorado en astronomía en la Universidad de Washington y hasta ese momento él no conocía la astrobiología, aunque la astrobiología estaba iniciando en la Universidad de Washington. Fue hasta que inició su postdoc cuando, eh, a partir de trabajos en, sobre Europa, la luna de Júpiter, eh, conoció y entendió mejor lo que era la astrobiología y pues llegó para quedarse en ella. Eh, su trabajo consiste en utilizar modelos numéricos eh, donde se estudia la habitabilidad del exoplaneta, de los exoplanetas considerando tanto aspectos astrofísicos, geofísicos y atmosféricos. A él le debemos los términos de exoplanetas eh, tidal venuses, o sea, este, eh, Venus que son generados por mareas y super ios que son como la luna io pero en grandote. Entonces, eh, pues muchas gracias por venir Rory, además es amante de la comida mexicana, porque como creció en Arizona, este, yeah, you, you were born in Arizona. No, no, en California. California, ok. Pero yo crecí en Tucson. Eh, ok, ahí. <risa> sí, sí, creció en Tucson, entonces él sabe mucho de la comida mexicana y, este, y le encanta el picante, así que si desean invitarlo a comer tacos, él será feliz. <risa> you will be happy to eat more tacos. <risa> Muchísimas gracias, Antígona. Es mi placer estar aquí hoy. Ya, yo quiero hablar, es que dar esta charla en el español, pero pienso que será mucho más mejor si yo cambio a uh, inglés. Lo siento. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, our newest neighbor, Proxima Centauri B, and in particular, a lot of the uh, research that's been done by the NASA Virtual Planetary Lab, uh, which is led by uh, Vicky Meadows at the University of Washington, and in which Antígona is a member. I'm going to be giving this talk today, but uh, it's really the sum of a large amount of work done by a lot of people, most of whom are at the University of, of Washington. Many of them are students of mine and of, of Professor Meadows. I have to give them a lot of thanks for, for what you're going to see today. So, like most of you, I uh, spent my childhood looking up at the stars, wondering if there were planets uh, orbiting them, wondering if there was life in the universe, uh, looking at star fields like this, Uh, this is a, a star field I, can't, I could not see growing up in Tucson, Arizona, and I don't think you can see it even here in La Ciudad de Mexico. This is, of course, uh, the star, this is a star field that contains the three closest stars to our sun. Uh, Alpha Centauri A and B are there at the top. Uh, that's actually two stars. They're a tight binary, uh, so you can't actually resolve them with your eye from the ground. And you might be able to spot the third planet, or the third star, excuse me, which is even closer. Does anybody see it? <laughs> you can't actually see the star with your naked eye. It's this one right here. Who, who saw it? Who, who, who knew it was there? <laughs> so this is Proxima Centauri, of course. Everybody knows this is the closest star to the sun. And uh, it was discovered about 100 years ago and was recently, uh, it was announced uh, in August that there is a planet orbiting in the habitable zone of this star. And uh, it's a great opportunity for all of us to think about finding life in the universe but this is a very different uh, star system, as I'm going to describe today, and so there's a lot we need to think about before we get too excited about the possibility that there is, in fact, life on this world. So, let's see. Uh, this is uh, the, oh, hold on. What's going on here? Got ahead of myself. Uh, let's see. 
There we go. Will it stay this time? Okay. This is uh, the discovery data. Uh, it was discovered through the radial velocity method, which is where we look at the, the, the movement of the star towards and away from Earth. Uh, this was a very difficult measurement to make for several reasons. The star is faint. Uh, it is also emits most of its light in the infrared wavelengths, which are uh, absorbed in our atmosphere. And the planet is very small, very low mass, uh, uh, only about about a third, uh, only about 30 percent larger than our own Earth. And uh, this signal took a long time to acquire. Uh, people started observing this uh, target in 1999. Uh, and it wasn't until about 2013 that uh, both there was enough data as well as advanced statistical methods to actually pull out a signal from the data that revealed the presence of a planet. So you can see that there are a lot of data points here. Um, and it's not especially clear that there is a planet here. But um, with hundreds of data points now, we, there is a pretty conclusive evidence that this is, in fact, a planet. And you can see it here with this best fit here. Just to be clear, this is a, these data points here that are, are highlighted are from a campaign known as the Pale Red Dot. This was a, a campaign led by Guillaume and Glada Escudé. And uh, they basically obtained 60 straight nights on the HARPS spectrograph in Chile. And uh, they managed to confirm that this planet was, in fact, there. They thought they had a signal there, but they weren't sure. But now they are after the new data. And as far as I can tell from talking with people, my colleagues, uh, around the world, most people think that this looks like a pretty solid detection, that this does look like it's probably a real planet. You know, it's always dangerous when you're right at the noise limit, but this one looks pretty good. So what are some of the basic facts we know about this system? It's kind of surprising. I, I, I wrote a paper that came out on the day of the discovery, because uh, Guillaume let me know ahead of time. And uh, there's actually not as much information as you might expect <laughs> to be known about Proxima Centauri. Uh, but nonetheless, there is certainly a pretty large amount. So when we look at the star, so it's about four and a quarter light years from Earth. Um, the mass of the star is only about 12%, that of our own sun. The radius is about 14%. It's only about one one thousandth as bright as our own sun, so a very dim star. Um, this age estimate is pretty uncertain, and it comes from, really, uh, knowledge of Alpha Centauri A and B which we can obtain some astro-seismic information, but it actually turns out even they aren't great astro-seismology targets because they lie at transition points um, in stellar evolution. Um, we actually, and we, a lot of people like to, like, a lot of people think that Proxima is a companion to Alpha Centauri A and B that is actually not known definitively. Um, there's something like a one in a million chance that it is a superposition in the sky, but uh, we don't actually know that um, from the energetics of the orbit. We don't actually know that it is, in fact, in orbit around Alpha Centauri A and B. If it is, what, what, what we do think is that it's about 15,000 astronomical units from, the, the, from that pair. So it's certainly in a very large separation. It's separated by about two degrees in the sky, if we were to look in the sky. So it's, it's certainly well separated. Um, the metallicity of Alpha Centauri A and B are estimated to be somewhere around 0.2 and 0.3. So this is a, a quite a large uh, enrichment of metallicities relative to our sun. That actually plays a, a, an important role in some of the analysis, although I'm not really going to have a chance to talk about this very much today. But it's a very if Proxima formed from a similar cloud of dust and gas as Alpha Centauri A and B, we should expect that it is also very metal rich. The planet we know even less about, <laughs> not surprisingly. Um, since it was discovered through the radial velocity method, we only know the minimum mass. We only know a, a lower limit, and that's at about 1.3 Earth masses. Uh, one year on Proxima Centauri b takes about 11.2 days. Uh, that, it orbits about uh, 20 times closer to its star than the Earth does. The eccentricity of the orbit is not well constrained, only to be something like less than about 0.35. And again, here's the semi-major axis. We don't know anything about its composition, its radius. This could be a planet more like Neptune than like Earth. Uh, at this point, we just don't know. So it's important to bear that in mind. Mainly today, I'm going to make the assumption that the planet is terrestrial, that it is something like the Earth. But that is by no means a given. It could certainly be something that I like to call a mini Neptune, something that is gaseous but still not very large. Um, and, and there is some evidence for a companion planet in this system. Um, it's not well constrained by the data at this time. Um, probably it, it could potentially be a, in a 50-day orbit. The best fit for that um, planet is in about an orbit of 212 days. 
Uh, and just, I also want to point out that the, way, the only way they actually were able to find the orbit of Proxima Centauri b is by removing that signal, which is a little bit dangerous. There's some concern there that they might have actually uh, done something to the data by removing this signal that they really don't constrain very well. But nonetheless, um, it does look pretty good. And so there might be another planet in the system. I suspect many people are looking at this star now. And so hopefully we'll know uh, pretty soon if there is, in fact, another planet there. So this system is very different from Earth, right? I mean, this is a very different star um, and a planet in a very different type of location. And so it's natural then to wonder, well, what makes us think it's habitable? And uh, our ideas for how it could be habitable come from the only planet we know of in the universe that is habitable and inhabited. And that's, of course, this beautiful world right here. We're zoomed down here. Um, so there's a, very, there's a big danger in extrapolating from a single data point, right? which is what we're trying to do. We're trying to take our knowledge of the Earth, project it into the heavens, and make an assumption as to where we think life might be. But there's some interesting features of our Earth that I think are pretty relevant that I want to point out. We see life in a lot of varied locations on Earth. Uh, you know, these movies aren't being showing up too well, but nonetheless, you, you can see that this is uh, what we call a black smoker. This is uh, life in the deep sea, several kilometers below the surface. No sunlight reaches this environment, and yet all of these little white uh, stalks here, these are all tube worms. They are all life that is living off the geothermal energy of the Earth. We also see life in hot springs, very hot, very acidic, or potentially very alkaline environments. Uh, where microorganisms are able to survive. They have no problem living in 75 degree water with pHs of 12. Uh, environments like that. Environments that would kill us instantly. <laughs> but like, we find life there. We also find life in sea ice. This is a, 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 a movie that um, some colleagues of mine at the University of Washington gave me where they went to the Arctic. They scooped up a bunch of ice melted it, and they found a whole bunch of little microorganisms living happily in this environment. And here you can see them swimming around, now being freed from their icy prison. Um, but these guys don't think it's a prison. They spend their entire life living in one millimeter wide channels of, of salty brine water. And that's where they live. We also find life in the driest deserts on Earth, the places like the Atacama Desert, where they measure rainfall in millimeters per century. Uh, and where life there basically is dormant for 100 years. It rains, it activates the, the life in the, in the soil. Uh, they live out uh, some part of their life cycle over the course of maybe 12 hours. And then they go back into being dormant again for the next 100 years. So these, at least it's estimates, that's longer than the, the typical lifetime of a graduate student. So we think that's what they, how long they live. But uh, we're not sure. But there's certainly life that goes through this sort of experience. So when we look at this a stunning array of, of life on Earth, uh, it gives us some hope going forward, because I like to think of Earth as being something more like many habitable planets at one. There are all these environments that you know, are just so exotic to those of us in this room, and yet life lives there comfortably and happily. And indeed, this discovery of these extremophiles, this life in extreme environments, is one of the main underpinnings of the new field of astrobiology. When it was these, it's only been recognized for about the last 30 or 40 years that life can exist in these kinds of environments. And it makes us think that we don't necessarily need to find a planet just like this out there. Maybe we can find a hot springs planet or a water world, and we would actually find life there. So we don't need to necessarily just find, for, find an Earth twin, but maybe something that has properties that are like these. So what, when we look at all of this diversity of life on Earth, there are some commonalities. Even though there are, there's this incredible diversity of habitats, there are some commonalities. And when we look at them, we see that they're, all life on Earth requires an energy source, which should come as no surprise. Uh, it all requires just a handful of elements. There are only five or six elements that all life on Earth requires. Of course, most life forms require more than those six, but they only need it's carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Iron is a bit controversial. There is a claim of one organism that does not require iron. All the rest do. So put that in parentheses there. Then there's liquid water. Uh, liquid water is the medium through which all the biochemical reactions occur. 
that allow the, 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 the molecular biochemistry to proceed that is really the, the hallmark of life on Earth. Uh, astrophysicists have informed us that two of these ingredients are very common in our universe. And they're the first two. Energy is everywhere, usually uh, in stars at least. Maybe I should say, say everywhere, but it's abundant. It's easy to find. These elements are some of the most common in the universe. It's liquid water that's the key. Liquid water is the limiting factor. And that's what we really use as our guide as we search for life in the universe. And in particular, when we think about exoplanets, not any liquid water will do. What we really want to do is find surface water. And that's because we want to have that water in contact with the atmosphere so that we can point our telescopes to those planets and hopefully get us a hint that there is life that is in contact with that atmosphere. And we might be able to get, say, a spectrum of that planet and determine if there is life on that planet or not. Subsurface water is, of course, very interesting. Uh, you know, we have moons in our, in our solar system, like this picture of Enceladus, which we, we know there is liquid water there. But I would certainly argue that it is hard to imagine how to look inside of a planet that is light years away. We can barely even see these planets right now. How are we going to see inside of it? So it's certainly possible that there are many, many habitable environments in the universe that are inhabited with life that are below the surface. But at least for the time being, at least for the foreseeable future, we're not going to be able to find life there just because that life is hidden from us. Uh, so we're going to look for water on the surface. That's what we want to really look at for a habitable planet. And that leads us to one of the uh, most classic concepts in this field, and that is the habitable zone. The habitable zone is basically where we think a planet like Earth could support water on its surface, and hence it's the first place we want to look for life. There are a few targets up here. Maybe you're familiar with some of them. Kepler-62f is probably the first potentially habitable uh, planet that was ever discovered. Um, there's also some uh, planets up here that are no longer with us, sadly. Please, a 581 D and G, they turned out to be artifacts. <laughs> so sadly, uh, we have to cross those off the list. Um, but I bring this up because, excuse me, <laughs> I bring that up because you know, I think I wanted to, I wanted to re-emphasize this point that as we look for these small planets, uh, astronomers are starting to figure out some important subtleties into how we look for these small planets. So these planets turned out to be artifacts due to stellar uh, pulsations, or not pulsations, but just stellar activity. So when we look to stars that are, to planets that are of similar size, you know, some, a planet like Proxima Centauri b has in fact passed these tests as well. So that also gives us more confidence to believe that it's actually there. So with that, let's put Proxima on the diagram. There it is. So right in the middle of the habitable zone, but in a very different part of the habitable zone from any other planets that we've discovered. Down here at put one two solar masses. So a pretty different type of environment in some ways, but still in this habitable zone as we like to define it. So that's, of course, the opportunity for Proxima Centauri b. It does exist in the habitable zone, which is our first, our first test that the planet needs to pass. But it's not the only test, right? I think that some people, probably not any of you in this room, but a lot of people get confused thinking that when you find a planet in the habitable zone, that means it is habitable. But of course, it's not the case. There are many other factors involved. And this is a diagram that came out of a, a meeting that uh, Vicki Meadows and I ran several years ago, and Tikano was there in Seattle, where we tried to identify what are all of the features, all the factors, all the phenomena that are relevant to the possibility that there is liquid surface water on a planet. There will be no test on this, but I hope that I, it's clear that there is a lot, and we can actually start to figure this out. You know, there's, we divided this up into three basic categories. There's the role of the star, there's the role of the planetary system, and then there's the properties of the planet itself. And of course, you probably can't read any of these, but the point is that there's a lot of different aspects of this. And the habitable zone is really just sort of the first uh, example of, of, a, of a requirement. And it, it exists in this larger space of parameters that we have to try and sort through to try and understand if there is actually liquid water on a planet, let alone if there is life. So let's take a look at some of the, the specific features for Proxima Centauri. So it's close to its host star, so we need to worry about atmospheric escape. There are tidal effects like tidal locking and tidal heating. The star actually takes a little while to reach the main sequence where hydrogen burning begins. 
Maybe there's orbital oscillations from the other planets. Is there magnetic shielding? You know, it just keeps going. Tidal, the orbit could have evolved by tides. The obliquity can change. That's what I mean by tilt erosion here. Uh, there could be orbital instabilities that have occurred in which planets are thrown out of the system. Uh, there can be compositional effects that can be pretty interesting. Turns out galactic migration is important. Uh, we, you know, when we look at the metallicity of, of Alpha Centauri A and B, models of how the galaxy's chemical composition has evolved with time suggest that Proxima Centauri formed about four kiloparsecs closer to the galactic center than we find it today. So it's gone through a very large uh, vacation down to these outer regions of these, uh, this, the galaxy. And finally, you know, we have to recognize that these aren't all independent processes. I mean, there can be interesting couplings and feedbacks between all of them. So the problem is massive. It is a very challenging problem to, uh, to try and understand how all of these different aspects uh, fit together and, and have affected how Proxima Centauri B has evolved with time. So, uh, yeah, and I, I do want to just point out that uh, most of this talk is going to be based off of this paper that uh, I put on the archive um, when the planet was discovered or announced on August 24th. Um, I'm also going to um, also describe some, at, at the end, I'll describe some revol results from uh, Vicki Meadows' paper that came out a few days later. And these two papers uh, basically work together to try and present a, uh, a complete picture of what we think Proxima Centauri B is actually like. I, of course, can't cover all of this in an hour-long talk, so I'm not going to do that today. I want to focus specifically on one in particular, which I believe um, the, the community has uh, agreed is basically the biggest obstacle, the biggest thing we need to worry about, and that is this one, stars, the stellar brightness early on. You know, when, um, for those of you that have followed this field for a little bit, uh, a lot of people worried about things like atmospheric escape due to stellar flares, and that's uh, work that like, uh, Antigona has really uh, led the, the field in. And a lot of people also worried about uh, tidal locking. I think most people have agreed now that those aren't really the big problems anymore. That's not, those are not um, you know, just nails in the coffin of, of planetary habitability. This one is actually pretty recently discovered, pretty recently recognized at least, as being an issue. And I should say that um, there was uh, also two papers from some European groups that came out at the same time, and they also stated that this was the biggest problem as well. So this is sort of a new aspect of this problem, and I want to spend a few minutes uh, talking about what's going on here. So uh, what's going with, with these low mass stars, these M dwarfs like uh, Proxima Centauri, is they actually take quite a while to reach the central pressures and densities that are required to initiate hydrogen fusion. Uh, so it's basically, they just don't have as much mass as a star like our own sun, so they just can't put that pressure into the center and early on until they collapse a little bit more. This can take up to two or three billion years to proceed um, for the very lowest mass stars, but Proxima is a little bigger than that, and it probably took somewhere around half of a billion years to, to actually initiate the thermonuclear uh, fusion in the core. So at first, Proxima is big and bright. It's, it's a larger star, and basically the gravitational energy being released due to the contraction is providing extra uh, luminosity for the star. And slowly, after about a half a billion years, uh, it gets about 10 times dimmer. Uh, its luminosity drops by a factor of 10. And uh, this was uh, initially pointed out in uh, this paper by my graduate student, uh, Rodrigo Luger, and I. Um, and we, of course, discussed it in the Proxima paper. And it's based on these models that go back you know, 10 years by uh, Baroth et al. And of all the stellar models suggest that this is really what's, what's happening. So uh, we tried to put together a, a, a guess, <laughs> for lack of a better word, as to what we think Proxima, uh, the star, was like early on. And that's shown in this diagram, where you know, here's the luminosity in the top left. Uh, this is the effective temperature of the star. And then here is the radius. You can see it's shrinking quite a bit. And then from some other proxies, we came up with what we believe the XUV, the X-ray and the UV uh, combined luminosity would be. Uh, low mass stars tend to be very active early on. They uh, emit a lot of high energy radiation, which can do a lot of damage to an atmosphere. And um, these, these red uh, dashed lines and the, and the pink, those are the best fits and uncertainties for the star today. So this is our model that goes into this. Um, into the system. So what does that do for Proxima b? Well, this is how we think the habitable zone has evolved with time. So the blue is the habitable zone. You can see the orbits of Mercury and Proxima Centauri b there. And you can see that 
uh, over hundreds of millions of years, in fact it's 160 million years, that uh, Proxima b was interior to the habitable zone where Venus is today, right? So this is why we're so concerned about this problem, is that basically Proxima Centauri b could have experienced maybe at least 100, perhaps even several hundred million years of a runaway greenhouse phase like on Venus. And it was probably took about 100 million years for Venus to lose all of its water. It's, there's a few steps to this process, but probably it was around 100 million years is how long it took. And so the fact that it's over 100 million years is our best guess for Proxima Centauri b makes us pretty concerned that you know, this could have happened on, uh, on Proxima Centauri b. And if it's lost all of its water by the time the habitable zone arrives, then it's game over for life on that planet. And the question then is, what happened to that planet during this phase, and are there any ways that we could avoid it? So this is what I think of as the biggest obstacle here. So if we consider planets that are more Earth-like, what would happen to it uh, if it did spend its time interior to the habitable zone? Uh, you can see models like this, where basically, and this is a bit complicated here, but uh, what we did is we considered a wide range of initial water inventory, initial water content, uh, and asked, well, what happens to that water over time? And here on this uh, top axis here, this is water mass in terrestrial oceans. So this is basically in units of how much water is in the ocean of the Earth today. And uh, we've considered several different models. So there's different initial water contents from ranging from one to 10 times as much as water as the Earth has. And we also wondered what happened to the oxygen in this process, because what's really happening here is that Water in the atmosphere is photolyzed by the star's XUV radiation. So the hydrogen and the oxygen are liberated from the water molecule. The hydrogen, being so low mass, is able to escape the gravitational uh, potential of the planet. But the oxygen, being 16 times heavier, is not able to escape, or at least not always. You know, it, it's much less efficient. So that means you can get oxygen building up in the atmosphere. So we wanted to know well, what's happening with that oxygen. And uh, so what we find here is that in many cases, if you don't have a large amount of water, you're going to lose it all within about 100 million years. So unless you get up to at least 10 times as much water as is on the Earth's oceans today, this planet has lost all of its surface water. The oxygen is also uh, can build up in the atmosphere over time. Now what we did is we kind of divided it up into two different possibilities because oxygen is basically the, the nastiest element in the universe very reactive. It, uh, well, if it can find anything to do, it's going to do it. <laughs> you know, it's going to try and bond with anything. Um, but you know, we don't really know. At some point, you have so much oxygen that you can't do anything with it anymore. And we don't know. We don't, you know this is an open question. What are the sinks? What are the, where, where does the oxygen go? And uh, so we considered a case where there was no sink for oxygen. So this is sort of a, the maximum amount of oxygen that can be produced on the planet. And then we said, OK, what happens if you just remove all that oxygen instantly? And so you can see, in these cases, the oxygen drops to zero. Um, so you can see you can start building up large amounts of oxygen, at least in terms of the percentage in the atmosphere. That's what this oxygen mixing ratio is. And in absolute terms, you can build up hundreds of bars of oxygen. So remember, one bar is the uh, atmospheric pressure on the Earth at sea level. So here we're talking about hundreds of times more oxygen than is in the, than, uh, our current, our, than is in the entire, that's, at least a, a pressure that's larger than the entire Earth's atmospheric pressure. Um, if you leave oxygen, the, the difference here between some of these curves is just due to what oxygen does in the atmosphere, how it changes uh, basically diffusion rates of, of oxygen and water through the atmosphere. So you can, and so these dashed lines, which correspond to an instant sink, correspond to how much oxygen had to be absorbed by whatever sink that was. So you know, the point here is that you know, we can lose a lot of water. And we can also build up a lot of oxygen on this planet. So if, if Proxima Centauri b formed where we find it today, this is, these are the sort of obstacles that needed to overcome. How does it deal with all of this? But we can look at this in a little more general kind of way, where what we've done is we've looked at considering a few different types of um, ideas as to how the planet began. And we can start trying to categorize where those planets, what types of planets they might be, where you can have you know, some planets where you have a lot of water left over and no oxygen. Hopefully you can read these axes. You can also have planets where there's no oxygen and no water. Those are, of course, uninhabitable. And then you get to these very interesting cases over here where you can have a lot of oxygen 
which we normally think of as an indicator for life, which is why, but it's not life here, it's due to this astrophysical effect. So that's a false positive for life. And maybe they're habitable. I don't know. You know, what does it mean if you have 500 bars of oxygen in your planet when life is trying to form? Oxygen, like I said, is very reactive. It does a great job of destroying uh, prebiotic molecules, things like methane or DNA, things like that, you know, amino acids. So um, a lot of oxygen is really, could be, could prevent life from ever evolving, or ever originating on a planet. And then of course you have planets that have a lot of oxygen and no water at all. Those definitely aren't habitable. So that's fascinating different possibilities for what's going on there. And this is for the case of inefficient oxygen sinks. So where the oxygen is just free to build up in the atmosphere over time. If you assume that oxygen is gone right away, of course you don't ever get any oxygen up here or in this region because this is, now, this is now the absorbed oxygen what was taken away. So if you have any water, you're potentially habitable, but you can still have lots of uninhabitable planets as well. So it's, uh, there's a lot of possibilities here and uh, we don't really know at this point what to expect. At least this is some guess, but it's, there's a lot more to think about. On the other hand, depending on how Proxima Centauri B formed, if it formed with a big gaseous envelope, like I talked about early on, maybe it had formed as something like a mini Neptune, maybe that early brightness and that early initially high, high energy flux was actually a good thing in terms of its life because maybe it could have blasted away a hydrogen envelope. Maybe if it formed like a mini Neptune, um, it would never have had life on it except that it was so close to this very active star and it was able to remove the hydrogen, protecting and shielding all that water that was below until once that hydrogen was removed, it revealed this habitable world below in which life could flourish. So sort of, sort of in cartoon form, it would be like imagining something like this, where a Neptune-like planet becomes an Earth-like planet. I like to call these habitable evaporated cores. Basically, they were originally sort of like a core to a giant planet, but you've evaporated away the hydrogen to reveal a habitable planet below. And it turns out this is actually a, a possible a scenario for Proxima Centauri b. So uh, what I want to show you now is just a, a similar plot to what you, I showed you before. I want to emphasize that we don't include any flaring or any of these sort of uh, stochastic effects. That's why I'm actually here this week <laughs> is to work with Antigona to try and start modeling flaring into the atmospheres of these planets. Um, but this, uh, these are sort of conservative estimates for how much, you can, how much hydrogen you can remove. So, you know, again, we're going to consider different amounts of hydrogen, so 1% and down, so not much hydrogen, right? You can't really remove a whole lot of hydrogen this way. You know, you can't actually turn something like Neptune into Earth, at least in our model, but we'll see what flaring does. Um, so consider these different cases. Uh, here is the envelope mass, the amount of hydrogen, and you can see that that early XUV flux is able to remove a lot of the hydrogen within 100 and here's the water that we believe was below the, the hydrogen envelope. And you can see that if we got up to something like one, if we had it one one thousandth of the mass of the planet was in, in hydrogen, you could have water left over at the end. And then you can still, of course, build up oxygen if you remove that hydrogen envelope too quickly, right? So there's a timing problem here. You have to make sure that you get rid of that hydrogen envelope late enough that you don't then still make your planet uninhabitable because it's, it's, it doesn't have that shield anymore. So, you know, when you look at this, you know, you can see that we can remove hydrogen, we can uh, retain the water, which is very nice, and in some cases, we don't get any of this abiotic oxygen, you know, we don't get oxygen built up by the astrophysics of, uh, of the star. So, this might be one way in which uh, Proxima Centauri b could have formed where it is, and be a habitable world today. So, I want to just briefly summarize uh, where I was just at here before we move on to the next part of the talk. So, uh, and actually what I, I want to, sorry, I'm getting on myself, I want to talk about some of the other results that are in, in, in my paper, um, and these are things that I'm not going to go into today, but if you want to ask me in the question session, I'm happy to, to talk about them some more. So let's go into them. So, uh, so the planet is almost assuredly tidally locked, so one side is facing the star probably, although not necessarily, um, but it may, if, if the orbit is eccentric, um, that might not be the case, as everybody in Antigonus class last hour learned. Uh, the orbit will circularize in a few billion years. So we don't, depending on what its initial eccentricity was, the planet might not be on a circular orbit today. It might have actually, the eccentricity could evolve from say 0.3 to 0.05 uh, during its lifetime. So it's kind of a different kind of world than our own as well, that the orbit does 
change in this long-term way. Uh, the tidal heating can be very severe on this kind of planet. It, makes, it can make Io look very weak. Uh, you know, it, it, it could, in fact, as, as Antigone mentioned in the introduction, it could potentially uh, create something that I would call like a tidal greenhouse, where basically the tidal heating is strong enough to actually trigger a runaway greenhouse and remove all the water from the planet. Pretty intense. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier as well, Proxima may have migrated by several kiloparsecs to the galaxy. Um, and that changes a lot of how it's evolved um, in terms of Proxima's orbit around Alpha Centauri A and B, if it's, if it's bound. Uh, and this is an interesting possibility too. If you form closer to the uh, center of the galaxy, there's a lot higher density, of, uh, a larger density of stars closer in. And so Proxima is on this almost comet-like orbit around Alpha Centauri A and B. And so passing stars can really change how uh, Proxima's orbit evolves. And that can actually lead to orbital <coughs> instabilities. Because basically, in some cases, Proxima becomes so close to Alpha Centauri A and B that uh, the gravitational effects of Alpha Centauri, a, Alpha Centauri A and B can perturb the orbits of the planets orbiting Proxima and actually cause them to go unstable and to be ejected into the galaxy. So it, that could have happened almost at any time. I mean, it could have been that the orbits went unstable just a few million years ago. Uh, we don't know. Uh, the composition is interesting. In particular, I've lately been getting interested in geophysics. And uh, you know, there's reasons to think that uh, Proxima Centauri b might be enriched in volatiles like potassium. Potassium is actually one of the main drivers of internal energy in our planet. But, it, our, uh, but our Earth is actually depleted by about a factor of eight or so. Um, in potassium compared to uh, meteorites, or I should maybe say chondritic asteroids. But if Proxima Centauri has, an has, has a composition that's similar to that, um, it could have a pretty intense um, amount of uh, heating in the interior. And uh, if you consider radiogenic heating or tidal heating, that can actually do interesting things to your planet's interior. Uh, for example, it can potentially shut off any geodynamo. It can actually quench the production of magnetic fields in the core. And so you can have this planet that, because it has so much more energy, it's been able to gain a, its, its inner core has grown and become a solid core, and it can no longer generate a magnetic field. And that, of course, can be dangerous for a planet orbiting an M-dwarf, where you have these intense activity and intense flaring. Uh, another interesting possibility I just want to throw up here, just because I thought it was interesting, is um, you know one of the main heat sources for asteroids in our solar system is aluminum-26, which has a half-life of something like 700,000 years. Normally, we dismiss that in terms of planetary evolution, um, but Proxima b probably formed within less than a million years. And if you actually try and turn all of the Earth's aluminum-26, uh, right, right now it's magnesium-26 in the Earth, but if you make it all aluminum-26, you get just such insane amounts of heating. I can't, I mean, I could, I had to put in one part per trillion of aluminum-26 into our model to get it not to break, because you can actually produce thousands and even tens of thousands of terawatts of power inside your planet with just one part per trillion aluminum-26. And so these planets around these low-mass stars, if they form quickly, this could be a, a very fascinating aspect of their evolution. If they started out, it'd be short, short-lived, but it would be at an absolutely intense uh, source of energy, and these planets would just be completely liquid rock for millions of years afterwards. And I don't know what that does to a planet's evolution. Um, we also looked at the orbital effects uh, with the other planet, planet C, quote unquote. Uh, it could potentially drive eccentricity and inclination cycles. Um, and it can also uh, change how the planet's obliquity evolves with time, including uh, in combination with uh, tidal effects, it could drive it to sort of a fixed state called a Cassini state. Um, where basically the obliquity is not quite zero, but it's uh, maintained at just a, a small non-zero value. So these are all the things we talked about in our paper. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we can talk about that more later if you want. But I want to just sort of, you know, just summarize this just a little bit. What are the main opportunities and obstacles? Well, the opportunities, of course, that it's in the habitable zone, but I want to just make sure that if there's one thing you take away from this talk, it's that the question is really if it was always in the habitable zone or what happened before the habitable zone arrived. Um, and you know, right now, if, if, if we might expect it to either have a large oxygen atmosphere, which is, was pretty unexpected, at least until a couple years ago, um, and that can occur because of that pre-main sequence brightness, or it could have removed a hydrogen envelope that has uh, you know, protected that interior 
uh, for a long period of time. The question, of course, from all this is, well, how do we find out which has happened? What are we going to do to actually learn what this planet is actually like? So I want to shift gears here a little bit and talk about the second paper now that the VPO published. So basically what we did is my, my graduate students and I, we worked furiously through the month of August and uh, put together this part of the talk that you've seen. And then we came up with these different scenarios for what the planet might be like. And we passed that off to Vicki Meadows and her students who then went about trying to model what the atmosphere was like and what features we might actually be able to detect uh, with current and future instruments. So I want to conclude the talk by talking about that, which I know a lot less about, so I'll just put that caveat out there. But um, I, I, I just want to, I do think it's pretty fascinating where we're going to go from here to try and learn more about Proxima Centauri B. Uh, here is the obligatory NASA slide uh, on where we are going in terms of uh, instrumentation, uh, assuming our president-elect wants to fund NASA. We'll see. Um, so here is the, the missions that have uh, been launched so far. So Hubble, Spitzer, Kepler, you've probably heard about all of these guys. Uh, we're all anxiously awaiting the launch of TESS uh, next year, which is uh, basically the next Kepler. Um, it's going to be another uh, mission that's going to find transiting exoplanets, potentially a lot of them in the habitable zone of nearby stars. Um, then a, a year later, we're going to get the James Webb Space Telescope, which actually has the power in very specific cases to actually search for biosignatures, to search for life on exoplanets um, through transmission spectroscopy. So looking at the light passing from the star through the atmosphere to our telescope. So this will be the first, first uh, telescope that might actually be able to find life on an exoplanet. But it'll be difficult. WFIRST is a, a nice telescope, but it's not uh, really going to help us find life in the universe. And then there is this sort of dark, faded out uh, mission here, New World's Telescope. That's something that will be launched in like the 2030s. Uh, NASA is just now starting to make plans on what that might be like, but um, that's certainly where we want to get to in the future. And these are all mapped out. You know, America has these, uh, every 10 years, we all get together and try and figure out what are the priorities for the field. And this is basically what's been mapped out for the last uh, 20 years or so as to what, how we want to try and explore the universe through uh, space telescopes. We don't also want to forget uh, the ground-based telescopes. You know, there's uh, uh, some very large telescopes being built throughout the world, 30 to 40 meters. They're coming online in the next five to 10 years. Um, we don't want to forget those. And uh, the key here is that these guys and these over here will actually be able to get spectra of a planet like Proxima Centauri b, um, potentially. You know, it's still some things have to go right for us, but. We're really looking at probably about 10 years, maybe 20 years before we'll actually get spectra of Proxima Centauri b, uh, its atmosphere. So anyway, let's uh, think about what we might actually find when we do that. Um, these are plots um, based on some of the modeling that my group did uh, as to what the atmospheric structure and composition might be like of Proxima Centauri b. In this case, I'm looking at these oxygen worlds. Um, these are, you know, pretty strange in places to imagine. And so, but you can actually put this into models. There are models like what Antigona uses, and you can calculate what the uh, the structure is going to be. So here is uh, an oxygen world with water still. So that's what the ocean means there. And you can see here's the H2O in blue. It does have blue. There's a sort of a, a troposphere, just like our Earth has. This is somewhat Earth-like, except that there's quite a bit of oxygen here. You can see it right here. There's this huge amount of oxygen in this atmosphere. You can also, we also considered uh, an oxygen planet that was desiccated, meaning it had no more water anymore. And so now you've lost this blue curve here of water, but you can still map out what, uh, the, uh, where, the, where the different elements and molecules are in the atmosphere uh, for these kinds of worlds. Uh, another example is we also consider what the early Earth might have looked like. So this is maybe just after we stripped away that hydrogen envelope. What might this planet be like? And so we call it Archean after the uh, Archean era on Earth, where we're basically uh, using mostly a modern atmosphere, except no oxygen, and now with 1% hydrogen and 5% CO2, so a lot more carbon dioxide than uh, the Earth has today. It turns out that uh, although Proxima b is right in the middle of its habitable zone, it needs to have considerably more carbon dioxide than Earth to be habitable. Uh, so they need global warming on this planet um, to, to survive. But you can do the same sort of game. You can look at the different uh, elements and molecules in the atmosphere. And here's the temperature profile as well. Um, and so you can make these, you can make these uh, estimates as to 
what the planet's atmosphere is going to be like. And then what we, we do in, in the virtual planetary lab um, and, uh, is that you then take these atmospheres and then you simulate what it would look like to uh, an observer. Because right? now we know where all the different elements are as a function of altitude, and we can start to make guesses as to what the, uh, the, the, uh, the planets might actually look like. And here's an example. Um, this is, I believe, for the oxygen case, too. It's kind of getting out the top of the screen here. But here are the spectra of, of these planets. So this is, again, an oxygen-like world. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to this peak right here, and there's some other of these uh, features here. This is um, what we call O4, or the oxygen-2 dimer which is basically two oxygen molecules, two O2 molecules, that bump into each other very briefly, just from the order of milliseconds. But, because, but in that moment when they are in contact and kind of stuck to each other, they actually produce uh, detectable spectral features. So if we were looking at this planet and we wanted to try and find out if it has life on it or if it in fact had this huge oxygen buildup early on, we'd want to look for a feature like this early on. So this would be a an indicator that the planet might not be habitable, that it really did suffer through this pre-main sequence evolution where the, uh, the oxygen built up. And this top panel here is what you would see in reflected spectra, so something from, say, like a space mission um, in 20 years from now. Um, this is what it would look like in transmission um, if the starlight was passing through the atmosphere and coming to the Earth. Uh, we don't think that Proxima Centauri b is transiting, but we weren't sure when we published it, so we stuck it in there anyway. And of course, it's a model for any, if we find any other planets that are like that. Um, just to show you another one, this is what the Archean type atmosphere, so maybe if it had been a, one of these habitable evaporated cores, again, what the spectra might look like. And this is, again, a reflectance spectra, so if it was directly imaged. So we can see that. Now, these spectra are, of course, these look great, right? It'd be wonderful to get a spectrum like that, but that's not what we're going to see. <laughs> you know, these, uh, this is the idealized case. We have to actually think about what would it be like to actually see this planet with the instruments that we're going to have. So we did that as well. And uh, here is basically what like an oxygen atmosphere might look like um, if we were looking at it through um, a, a mission like uh, the uh, that New Worlds Telescope, which here I'm calling Lou Guar. They're nest, you know, since this mission hasn't, doesn't actually exist yet, people have a lot of names for it. And uh, there's also these extremely large telescopes. And then HAPEX is sort of a, a smaller mission that's in the planning phases as well. And you can see that these, these are these different um, models for what you would look like. So in particular, I want to draw your attention to the, the lower panels here. This is the flux that we would receive from these planets from these different instruments. And as a function of wavelength, note that the wavelength ranges are pretty different here. And that's just because of the different uh, instruments that are, are being proposed. So for these, the HABEX, which is just 6.5 meters, I mean just 6.5 meters in space, but uh, you can get a little bit of the spectrum here. Um, but you can't get that O4 feature, that oxygen dimer. Yeah. However, with something like Louvoir, this a 16 meter class space mission with a coronagraph, uh, you can get the O4 feature, which is right here. So this would be great to be able to see that for a, a star like, or planet like Proxima Centauri b. And then finally, this is what we would think it might look like if you used a, a 30 meter or 40 meter uh, telescope from the ground. Again, you could get the, uh, the oxygen four feature here. So it might be the case that um, the ground-based telescopes are going to get uh, the information on this system uh, before we get it to space. We might actually be able to do it from the ground. Uh, I also want to point out there's an interesting possibility of uh, seeing aurora on this planet. Um, you know, there is this, it is this active star, and maybe it has a huge oxygen envelope, so we might be able to see the oxygen green line. Uh, we actually looked for it in the discovery data um, in this paper led by Rodrigo Luger again, um, and we couldn't find it. But of course, we didn't expect we really would. It probably, you know, what we really think is that it's going to take about 40 hours with one of these 30 meter telescopes to be able to uh, actually see this. But that would be great to see, you know, uh, an aurora on an exoplanet. Um, and this might be because, and this is one of those cases where because it is so close, this is only enabled because of how close Proxima is. All right, so I want to conclude with something a little more fun. Uh, and this is, well, we, since we produce these spectra, uh, we wanted to think about what are the different colors in this system actually like. And uh, so one of the graduate students, uh, Jake Lustig-Jager, he actually took the spectra that uh, were generated and convolved them with the response of our eyeball, at least for most of us, <laughs> um, and uh, asked what was the color look like. And you know, who knows how your projector is doing here, but Proxima Centauri, it's a, a red dwarf, we like to say, but really it's 
more like this peach color, you know. And uh, you know, if it's Earth-like, it not, it's not a blue, it's not a blue color anymore. It's sort of more of a purple color. Um, and then there's these other possibilities too, like uh, if it was an Archean-type planet, um, if it was oxygen-dominated, that's when we see blue. So we see it, it looks blue, that's bad, <laughs> because that means it's probably got a lot of oxygen on it. You know, it could also be something like Venus. You know, after all, it might have gone through a run with greenhouse for uh, 150 million years, and that's sort of this peak color as well. So, you know, when we uh, think about the Earth, right, this is uh, this classic image uh, from Voyager, taken about 25 years ago, where Earth is the pale blue dot here from 3.7 billion miles away. You just have to wonder if maybe instead we're going to be looking for the pale purple dot. Uh, so, when we finally see the, the direct image of Proxima Centauri b, you know, pray for purple. We don't want to see blue. That means it's not habitable. So, I'm going to wrap it up here with my uh, summary slide which doesn't cover everything really, but you know, I just hope that I've made it clear that there's a, it's a fascinating world. Uh, there's certainly a lot of different phenomena have happened on this planet than have, uh, on that planet than have happened on our own. And if Proxima Centauri B is habitable, it has gone through a very different path. It has a very different history than our own. And so, you know, I've just touched on a couple of these, like the pre-main sequence phase. Um, but I also have also talked about, you know, that we can actually learn about this. You know, we can take our models and make some predictions, and hopefully in the next 10 to 20 years, we'll start to see if we can find any of these biosignatures on this planet. Um, if today wasn't enough, uh, I encourage you to check out these papers. They are all on the archive. They're all preprints are available. And I'm here all next week, too. So uh, I'd be love to talk to any of you who are, are more interested. Um, I can try and learn some more Spanish, too, in the interim, <laughs> if, you, if you need me to. Uh, but anyway, thank you so much for your attention, and I'm happy to take more questions now. <laughs> okay. No hay preguntas. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> said this at the beginning, but do you assume that the semi-major axis remains the same as it is observed today? No, we, we don't assume that. Okay. Um, and, but at the same time, it's hard to know exactly what that evolution has been. Um, so in most cases, I should say in most cases we do make that assumption, but, in, but we don't always make that assumption. And that turns out not to matter too much. But uh, yeah, you don't really get, you can't do something like have the planet move by tides with the habitable zone, sure. for example. That's, that's out of but, the... But for example, um, I guess you don't go into where it should have been formed within like the part of the planet. Yeah, like, so... A right. little bit of the migration history or something. Right. Yeah, so we don't really deal with the formation of aspect of it at all. Um, you know, so if we wanted to do something like, say, form it farther away um, and then have it migrate in, that process still has to happen in the first few million years, right? And so even if you can get parked at that orbit a little bit later, it's very difficult to put it there after the, the main sequence has begun. So yeah, because it's just that the 150 million years is just too long. One way you could imagine doing it is through some sort of like uh, orbital instability, you know, like the Nice instability that potentially happened in our solar system. Then the problem is you probably create an enormous tidal heating effect on the planet because it's very unlikely to put it in that orbit on a circular orbit. So yeah, it's, it's difficult to figure out how to have form it somewhere else where it's safe and then put it in the current orbit today. But you know, it's, it's possible, we, we can't rule it out, but it would be a very fortuitous event. We'd be very lucky for that planet for that to happen. Talking about uh, safety, uh -huh. uh, uh, Proxima Centauri is a very low mass star. Yes. And uh, it, it was probably extremely active when it uh, yeah. was uh, born. Uh, uh, do you think uh, that at that activity would simply blow away the hydrogen envelope or whatever and, and, and just leave <laughs> nothing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, right uh, because it's, it's, they, they are very, very active. Yes, no, it's a great point. And then, you know, I am. I didn't imagine a, a, a very optimistic scenario there. 
Um, there's one other thing that's hard to imagine, though, is how you keep all of the gases that are inside the planet inside the planet later on. You know, the Earth, you know, our atmosphere is outgassed, right? This is not the atmosphere we formed with. So even though if you blew it away early on, you might be able to reform it later. Uh, you know, and that, you know, there's probably something like five or ten times more water in the interior of the Earth than is on its surface. So even if you did blow out the atmosphere, you know, you might be able to gain access to water below. But you do have other issues like, I mean, you know, if, if it is very tightly heated, you might overturn your mantle very quickly, outgas all of that early on too. You know, it, it's, it's just a lot of if-thens, right? <laughs> you know, that's, that's all my code is, if-then, if-then, if-then. You know, because it's, it's very complicated. But yeah, these are all things that we're trying to imagine and understand. But at this point, I don't think we understand, you know, what really has happened. But it's a great, great point. It's still active. Yes, and it is still active, right? Yeah, yeah, no, there's, there's one thing I didn't talk about is there, there was um, a, a photometric monitoring campaign that was independent of this, of, of the discovery, and they found that it's very likely that probably once a year on Proxima is an event as large as the largest flares that have ever been detected on other planets just by extending a power law. You, know, you don't see that event, you're very unlikely to see that, but there's something like a Carrington event every week on Proxima, <laughs> you know, so yeah. Satellite systems would be tricky on that, on that planet, but yeah, it's certainly still very active today. Yeah. And you said before about uh, how we can measure the loss of hydrogen or uh -huh. they move. Uh, Mars also lose water, right? There is not some kind of model that you can use and transpolate. Yeah, potentially we could ex use a model like that. We didn't try that in this preliminary study. Uh, but you're right in that Mars could be uh, an analog to any sort of hydrogen or water loss on this planet. You know, it is, I think the biggest difference is that Mars is so small, right? It's just the gravitational field is very different there. And so I'm not, you know, I'm, and so I'm not sure quite how applicable it would be. We can use sort of simple models uh, that, you know, and that's what we did in this case, is we just use simple analytic models from the 1980s. To, uh, to explore this, but uh, they, definitely the Mars community has developed some very sophisticated models for atmospheric loss there, but <clears throat> you know, we don't have that expertise in our group, but I hope other people will try and do that. I think that would be a great idea, so if you have access to those models, <laughs> you, should, you should do it. But uh, yeah, I think that, you know, I, I, do, I do hope that the community does try and take some of the lessons from Mars and apply it to Proxima Centauri B because they are relevant. Yeah. Uh, what is the probability that the planet uh, was uh, a rocky planet? What is the problem? Uh, is rocky? Rocky? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a lot of aspects to that question. Um, I think the first, the first thing to say is that you know, we don't know its mass at this point, right? So it could be 10 or 20 Earth masses. It could be larger than Neptune. It could, could even be the size of Saturn. But um, the geometry of the, the, the problem is that it's probably something like a 90% chance that it's less than five Earth masses. So that's where we think it's probably going to be in the rocky range. The other aspect of the problem, though, is that it could, you know, it doesn't have to start out rocky, like I said. It could, it has atmosphere could be blown away. Um, so, you know, there's a question, there's a difference between is it primordial or is it something that it was evolved into? Um, so all, all I can really say is that um, there's probably a 90% chance that it's less than five Earth masses which is when we look at the Kepler planets, that seems to be a very strong, there's a very, you're very likely to be rocky if the planet is less than five Earth masses. At least that's, there's some model dependence there, but yeah. I would say there's a good chance that it's in the range that we think would be rocky. How is that for a non-answer? <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Another <laughs> question? Um, do you have a way of distinguishing between the primordial rocky planets and the evaporated cores, either by you know spectral signatures in the work that Vicky Meadows did or yeah. anything? Yeah, that's, it's a it's a really great question, and I mean at this point I think the answer is no. You know the way we do this, say like on Venus, uh, to know that it's lost water is through isotopes, mm -hmm. right? You can look for deuterium and things like that. Uh, unfortunately distinguishing different isotopes 
on an exoplanet spectra is very difficult, right? I mean, you saw, you know, the slide, the, you know, the slide I showed you a couple minutes ago. We're praying for a resolution 70 spectrum, right? I mean, you know, the isotopes are <laughs> the different. The splitting on the isotopes is just so it's it's so minuscule in this even this range. So, you know, I think in the foreseeable future. I mean, it's not going to happen. I mean, we need to wait for the 50 meter space telescopes to get at that. But, you know, it's, it's really, I think the isotopes are the best way to get at that just because heavier elements are less likely to escape. Alguna última pregunta? Bueno, pues entonces vamos por terminar el coloquio en esta sesión. Muchas gracias a todos. Le entregamos a nuestro invitado un. Un regalo de parte del instituto y un... ¿Un regalo? Sí. Y un reconocimiento. Mi viaje aquí es mi regalo, ¿verdad? Muchas gracias.